All right, well, welcome everyone. Today's session is going to be um, Ask a Patient Regarding Heart Rate. Uh, my name is Sandeep. I did the session last, um, last time. So different types of problems that you might be called to. Can everyone hear me okay? If someone just writes in the group. I just presume you can hear me. Yeah, I'll carry on. Um, okay, so basically different types of problems that you can have. Um, well, we've got the first one, the most common is tachycardia. You're asked to be, you're asked to, be, uh, you're asked to review a patient that's got a heart rate above 100. Next one is bradycardia, less than 60. Some of these are symptomatic patients and some of these are asymptomatic patients. So you've been asked uh, to come review a patient. Uh, what do you ask the nurse? So the key thing is to ask whether they've had any symptoms, particularly chest pain, palpitations, any shortness of breath, any loss of consciousness. You also want to know whether this episode has been asymptomatic. How was their heart rate earlier? Were they always tachycardic, bradycardic, or is this a new thing? And how is their blood pressure? Is it, all, is it low and they've got tachycardia? Are they hypertensive or is it pretty much normal? Then do, what do you want them to do for you? Well, one of the first things you want them to do is a set of repeat observations, including a heart rate, just to see whether that was a one-off. ECGs, particularly if they've got chest pain, you want to have serial ECGs rather than just the one. And then lying and standing blood pressure, which is particularly important if they're bradycardic, and we'll talk about orthostatic hypertension later. So, a to E assessment, if you've been called to a patient who's tachycardic, I'm gonna just run through this. It's very much a whistle stop talk. So I'm sure most of you know, um, you know, the stuff that we're talking about. It's just key things that you sometimes get missed or sometimes don't get included in, in the differential when you're thinking about tachycardia. So airway, you wanna look for hypoxia, make sure there's no uh, cause of that, particularly because this is known to cause ventricular tachycardia. Breathing, most of this is to look for signs of shock, syncope, MI and heart failure, which are essentially signs that the tachycardia has decompensated. So you're looking for crackles, heart failure, uh, could be sepsis driving a sign of tachycardia, wheeze can again mean heart failure or could just mean they've got salbutamol running and that's caused them to be um, tachycardic, reduced air entry, tachypnea, particularly PE is another one that can often go um, sort of missed because patients are just tachycardic and nil else. Okay, moving on to circulation. Just gonna run through this very briefly. Essentially, pretty much the same sort of stuff. Either they've got um, hypertension and shock and they've got low blood pressure and a high heart rate, or they might be hypertensive, particularly in atrial fibrillation. If they've got a new murmur or a murmur, um, it could mean a lot of things. So if they've had infective endocarditis or they've had a temperature, they could have a thrombus, an aortic root abscess. Think about valvular lesions making uh, AF and flutter more likely. And then just making sure that you check for general signs of heart failure. So moving on to um, D, disability. You're checking for blood glucose like you do in most situations, make sure the patient's not got DK or Addison's. Um, AFPU, unresponsive, think this is more uh, worrying if they've got, if uh, they might have ventricular tachycardia or they've got risk factors ventricular tachycardia. GCS, if you think their GCS is low, could they be, um, could they be alcoholic? Do they have a, an acute alcohol excess? This could lead to AF, predispose you to it. And then E for exposure, checking for temperature and sepsis that can predispose to AF. Injury, pain can cause sinus tachycardia. If, you've had, if the patient's had a head injury, subarachnoid hemorrhages um, are, are known to cause arrhythmias, particularly ST changes in VT. Um, and then a bleed can cause shock. Leg swelling that could be a DVT might be an, a, a sign of an underlying PE. And tremor is quite an extensive one, so you can have lots of reasons that somebody might have a tremor. Anxiety can cause tremor and tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia can cause tremor. And then if they've had um, a hyperthyroid picture, this can lead to AF uh, or SVT, and that would also present as a tremor. Then you've got, um, in terms of the abdomen, looking for signs of chronic liver disease, predisposition to AF. And again, goiter, looking for risk factors such as hyperthyroid that would predispose you to AF, flutter, and SVT. 
moving on to the history. If anybody's got any questions, we can um, do them at the end. I just thought I'd get through. So moving on to the history, uh, one of the most common symptoms that you'll ask about is chest pain. So what you're trying to, I guess, assert is whether they've had an MI. MIs increase your risk of having ventricular tachycardia. If they've had a history of stable or unstable angina, this can lead to AF. If they've got chest pain, this might be PE. If they've had trauma to the chest, this can predispose to ventricular tachycardia too. Next is loss of consciousness. It's unlikely that they'll have ventricular fibrillation and you'll be reviewing them and asking them questions, but it's, thing, it's something to consider. It could be possible they've had a run of VT and they've had a loss of, con they've had an episode of um, a reduced GCS and now they're back with it. So consider that in particular if somebody is presenting with a uh, loss of consciousness when you go and see them. And you've got shortness of breath, think about PE, think heart failure, predisposition to AF, but also decompensation to heart failure. And then SVT, palpitations, ask them about when they have felt these palpitations. Is it during rest? Is it during sleep at nighttime? If it is, it's most likely that these are ventricular ectopics, but they're important nevertheless to ask to work out whether this is a symptomatic or an asymptomatic tachycardia. Look for leg swelling, heart failure, DVT, cellulitis, cellulitis in particular, thinking about AF rather than PE. And then precipitating factors. So this is mainly, again, around AF. Infections, pneumonia, UTIs, alcohol excess, withdrawal and chronic alcohol intake can also lead to AF. Exercise intolerance. Somebody that's unfit generally might have a resting uh, tachycardia certain medications, which we'll go through in a little while, and then thyroid symptoms, hyperthyroid can predispose both to sinus and AF. Going through the past medical history, ask them if you've had any previous episodes, whether that's of palpitations or any chest pain. Look at their cardiac history. Have they had a previous or a recent MI? This would be um, particularly in keeping with things like ventricular tachycardia, which they will be at risk of. Ischemic heart disease, risk increasing the risk of AF, structural valvular, valvular problems, hypertension, again AF, hyperthyroid and diabetes. Looking at the drugs that cause uh, sinus tachycardia, a lot, of them, a lot of our patients will be prescribed them, so it's important to review the medications to make sure that it's not a drug cause. Levothyroxine, just like hyperthyroid, salbutamol, anticholinergics like atropine, ipotropium, tolteridone, caffeine, nicotine, cocaine. It's important to ask patients about their recreational drug use, but also about their smoking and their alcohol. So investigations. So we'll talk about ECGs later, but blood gases, if you're doing a blood gas for someone's hypoxic, if somebody's got type one respiratory failure, the PE, a PE might be causing tachycardia. If someone's got a raised lactate, think sepsis, driving potentially an AF, this is before you've got an ECG. Uh, if somebody's acidotic, whether that's lactic acidosis, respiratory metabolic, this can increase the risk of them developing ventricular tachycardia. So if you see that on a gas, think about that. When you do the bloods, look for electrolyte abnormalities, high or low potassium, low magnesium and low calcium are known to cause prolonged QT. And obviously if you've got risk factors prolonged QT, this can lead to tussades de point. White cells, sepsis, TFTs, again, we're looking for hyperthyroid, D-dimers, PE and TROP for a recent MI. Looking at chest X-rays, um, most of the time you're looking for cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema, signs of, um, signs of heart failure. So you're looking for you know, uh, pulmonary vein dilatation, upper lobe diversion, air bronchograms, airspace pacification. So that's fluid within the alveoli. So this sort of um, diffuse pacification picture that you get here. And then the claustrophrenic angles are not very clear and potentially pleural effusions. If you're doing an echo, you want to consider um, whether that echo is needed in, a, in an acute sense or whether it's more whether you're looking at chronic disease. So in an acute situation, if the patient's had M an MI, you're looking for potentially acute mitral regurgitation. If they've got infective endocarditis and they become tachycardic, you're wondering whether they've got an aortic root abscess, whether this AF is driven by something like a thrombus, or whether they've got new onset heart failure, so they've got poor left ventricular function, secondary to possibly SVT or AF. And if they've got massive P, whether they've got any right heart strain. Chronically, 
you're monitoring for left ventricular systolic dysfunction, val valvular abnormalities, which would predispose you to different types of tachyarrhythmias, and then structural abnormalities. Valvular disease makes AF more likely, as does uh, damage to sort of the structure, because the sort of uh, the rate is controlled in the area between the pulmonary veins and the left atrium. So sinus tachycardia. So most common cause, there's lots of drugs that cause it. We've talked about some of them. There's lots of things that we haven't spoken about that could go on about. So we spoke about alcohol, excess, withdrawal, chronic intake, all of these, um, pain, carcinoid. There's lots of endocrine reasons why someone might have um, sinus tachycardia. You've got pheochromocytomas. Essentially, the key with sinus tachycardia is diagnose that it's sinus, identify and treat the underlying cause, but don't treat the tachycardia alone. So you don't want to be giving them beta blockers because often they'll often if they've got sinus tachycardia, what you're worried about is are they compensating for their blood pressure? If you give them beta blockers, their blood pressure will drop, heart rate will slow, and then they'll end up becoming unwell from decompensation. Next, we've got AF. Again, I'm not going to labour you too much about um, AF because I'm sure you all um, have been over it many, many times. But essentially, no P waves and irregularly irregular. Identify the underlying cause, treat it, things like antibiotics, IV fluids. If alcohol has caused a first presentation of AF, it's often known as holiday heart syndrome. Essentially, it's IV fluids as a treatment. One thing that often gets mistaken for uh, AF is this. This is um, sinus arrhythmia or atrial arrhythmia, it's basically where the rate, um, the rhythm is irregularly irregular, but there are P waves present. And sometimes the P waves um, vary in morphology. So just be careful with that. It, most of the time it's benign and it doesn't really need treating unless they're symptomatic. Um, the other thing that AF is sometimes confused with is Mobitz type one, which is second degree AV node block and somebody having frequent premature atrial ectopics. So, Briefly going over classifications for AF and when to treat and when to leave alone. If they've had a first episode, you sort of want to work out whether they need to be rhythm controlled or whether you can just treat the underlying cause. But if they have a second episode, then you start classifying AF. So you've got paroxysmal AF. It's essentially AF that spontaneously terminates, less than seven day duration. You've got persistent AF, which is more than seven days. And then you've got permanent, which is continuous. The things that you need to know for your on calls, when do you need to DC cardio about somebody if they've got uh, hemodynamic instability, um, if they've had syncope, if they've had if they've got heart failure with the AF, if they've had an MI and now this is a resultant AF, and also if they've if you've tried um, rhythm control with drugs and it still hasn't worked. And when you do synchronize um, the DC cardio version, make sure that you do it to the R waves, not to the T waves, otherwise you'll end up in asystole. So management, again, I'm just going to briefly run through this because I'm sure it's just more of the same stuff that you already know. Um, the rate control is, the rate control of AF is probably what we do the most in hospital, and that's because our patients are elderly and they have had the AF for more than 48 hours. If they've had it for less than 48 hours, they're young, their first response, you could consider rhythm control. And this is often done um, if they're unwell, DC cardioversion. Um, if you know their cardiac history, then Fleconide if they're not got any like structural abnormalities. Um, otherwise, amiodarone. And most of the time, if you're going to rate control someone, it's calcium channel blockers, unless unless they've got heart failure, in which case it's digoxin. Sometimes this pill in the pocket strategy is used if they've got no sort of heart failure, no ischemic heart disease, infrequent symptoms, um, and their blood pressure is good. They they can sometimes keep a fleconide um, pill in their pocket and take it as and when. The main thing to remember about anticoagulating patients is that you must consent them. Often patients uh, are starting anticoagulation, they don't know why, you need to fill out a lot of paperwork these days when you start somebody on anticoagulation, but you must have a chat about the risks and the benefits of starting somebody on a DOAC and what that means for them in the future. Always work out their chance VASC score. Next most common sort of tachycardia is SVT. This is narrow complex tachycardia, regular. Um, the P waves are present, but often they merge into these QRS complexes. So it's quite difficult to tell um, when you look at it like that. Usually it's quite a, a high um, heart rate. So something more than about 140. Risk factors for getting SVT or having SVT previously. If you've got a structural cardi if you've got a structural cardiac anomaly, that will cause um, issues and SVT can occur. 
management, which I'm sure you all know, Balsava maneuver, essentially this carotid massage increases the pressure and this reduces the venous return, which helps to regulate um, uh, back in sinus rhythm. Next, you've got adenosine, six and then 12, 12. So you start with six milligrams. If it doesn't work, then you try with uh, a, a bolus of 12. If that doesn't work, then another 12. If a patient has asthma, then this is contraindicated. You must use verapamil. And if adenosine doesn't work, also try um, verapamil. And if um, none of that really works, it's cardiovascular. VT, I'm sure you all know the ALS um, algorithm for managing broad complex and narrow complex tachycardias, but essentially this is a monomorphic ventricular, tachy um, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is broad complex. Check the potassium, check the magnesium, um, both high and low potassium can cause VT. Obviously, if they're pulseless, you must carry out um, an arrest protocol. Sometimes... VT can look like SVT with um, aberrant conduction, so um, bundle branch block. So this is VT, essentially, it's all sort of the same height on the same axis, um, and it looks quite uniform. Sometimes SVT with uh, bundle branch block can look like VT, and if you're in doubt uh, during your on-calls, treat it as VT. Some of the things that can suggest VT rather than SVT are AV node, sorry, AV dissociation, having fusion or capture beats present, um, if you've got entirely positive or negative uh, QRS conduction, so everything's going in the in the same direction on on all the leads. Um, if they've had a previous ischemic heart disease history, or if the if the QRS is particularly wide, more than about one hundred and sixty. So, quick um, run through the management. So, you've got adverse signs. These are sort of indications to cardiovert a patient with BT, uh, DC cardiovert a patient. So. If they're hemodynamically in, unstable, their heart rates, sorry, their blood pressure is quite low, or they've got chest pain, they might have an MI alongside this ventricular tachycardia, heart failure or loss of consciousness, then you must cardiovert. If they've got none of those signs, um, then try antiarrhythmics. Most of the time, the first line is going to be amiodarone, but you need a central line for the loading dose and then a 24 hour infusion following that. Sometimes people try lidocaine if this doesn't work, but often it's not very successful. And if it doesn't work, you end up DC cardioverting the patient. Um, one of the, uh, if it's refractory, one of the contraindications of lidocaine is having severe heart failure. In the long run, they'll probably need electrophysiology and uh, an ICD put in if they've got refractory DT. Briefly, Tossard's de Poix. So if somebody, um, so this is just Tossard's de Poix, it's polymorphic VT. So there's, uh, it's VT, but then rotation across the sort of axis, really. Broad complexes, no P waves. Um, and it's got this sort of, this shape of where it sort of increases and decreases in amplitude. Causes of long QT predispose you to Tossard's de Poix. So any sort of, um, the drugs that sort of cause it are amiodarone, sotalol, those sort of things, SSRIs, um, tricyclic antidepressants can cause it, erythromycin, digoxin. Um, and then you've got things like Romano Ward syndrome, congenital diseases that cause long QT or long QT syndrome, and then think lithium. You want to make sure that the potassium, magnesium, and calcium again are fairly well monitored because they can cause this and also subarachnoid hemorrhages. Unknown. Management's pretty simple. It's two milligram. It's two grams, sorry, of uh, ivory magnesium, and again, similar sort of situation where they're unstable. You want to make sure that they're um, DC cardioverted. Bradycardia. So we've talked about tachycardia. Now moving on to bradycardia, a quick run through of the A to E assessment. It's pretty much the same for A and B. You want to check they're not hypoxic and check they've not got signs of heart failure. But some of the differences um, in terms of circulation, you want to do a line and sign blood pressure if the sinus um, to check it, um, because this might um, patients with sinus bradycardia often have orthostatic hypotension. Sometimes they present with hypertension. So I'll talk about that in a second. So if a patient's got Cushing's reflex, they might have they might present with hypertension if they've got um, something that's causing increase in their intracranial pressure. So um, hypertension is an important one to look out for. Poor urine output and AKI, think, think amyloid and possible heart, um, complete heart block. Disability. So again, we're talking about increased um, intracranial pressure, papillary edema, look for focal neurology. Check the BMs in diabetics. Patients have, can have cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy that can cause bradycardia. And adrenal insufficiency can cause bradycardia too. And then everything else. 
goiter, weight gain, cold peripheries, hair loss, thinking about hypothyroid. Hypothermia can be another cause of sinus bradycardia. So can eating disorders like anorexia. And also ask or check when the OBS were done. If the patient's sleeping, they can develop bradycardia too. So in addition to things we've talked about, bradycardia, if you have chest pain, one of the things we can worry about is inferior MI. This is particularly known to cause second and third degree AV node block. Um, it's quite common and doesn't usually need uh, intervention because it sort of clears up on its own. But if they had an anterior MI, then be pay particular concern because they will need um, some intervention. Next, um, shortness of breath. So just like uh, tachycardia, bradycardia, whether it's sinus or heart block can lead to heart failure. Then you've got dizziness upon standing, so orthostatic hypertension, we spoke about collapse, loss of consciousness, feeling faint. They might have had a build-up to these symptoms. These can all be both uh, sinus and uh, heart block. If they've had weight gain, think heart failure, decompensation, but also hypothyroid. Similarly, hypothermia can lead to sinus bradycardia. And then visual changes, hypothyroid and Cushing's. Um, ask them about head injury, and then you've got odd symptoms, whether, you know, do a screen to see if they've got any symptoms of weight loss, cancer, um, but also tiredness, myeloma, all of these can cause uh, amyloid myeloma and Lyme disease, sorry, amyloid and myeloma can cause um, heart block, but also if they've got any rash, odd diseases like Lyme disease, Lyme disease and Chagas can also cause uh, heart block. Ask patients also about exercise. That's one thing um, I'll go into a second because the more athletic someone is, the more likely that the, the more they're likely to be bradycardic. So, um, in those patients, if they present with a particularly normal pulse, sometimes that's more, more worrying for tachycardia than um, than if they, they rarely present with uh, heart rates of above 100 tachycardia. But if they're bradycardic, it might just be normal for them. So, past medical history. You want to ask about things that will predispose them to having heart block. So whether they've got a history of um, myocardial infarction or IHD, whether they have um, AF, so they could be on digoxin beta blockers. Um, these would both cause the heart rate to reduce. Um, do they have a pacemaker? Is pacemaker working properly? Thyroid surgery or whether they're hypothyroid. So if they've had a thyroidectomy, this, they might have um, fractory hypothyroid. Sorry, they might have um, hypothyroid as a as a result. Are they hypertensive? Again, do they have a space occupying lesion of some description? This is all Cushing's reflex. Eating disorders, um, do they have glaucoma, beta blocker, eye drops are known to reduce heart rates and cause bradycardia. Cardiac surgery, do they have third degree heart block because of um, scar tissue? The drugs that you want to look out for, I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, but digoxin, um, amiodarone, anesthetics of some description. I think these days they, they can give glycopyrrolate to kind of stop the effects of these alpha agonists, but um, often they, they used to cause um, some bradycardia post-op. Um, and then social history, ask them about their social tolerance. Have they been abroad? Unlikely to happen these days, but um, certain diseases can cause heart block as a result, so Chagas and Lyme disease. And this is uh, an example of digoxin toxicity. So um, here you've got the um, downsloping ST depression, the reverse tick in lead to, and you, you can develop short QT as well as bradycardia. So investigations. We'll talk about ECGs in a little while. Um, bloods. So you want to make sure you're looking for hyperkalemic patients that can cause bradycardia, high magnesium, calcium, is low, that can lead to that too. You want to check for hypothyroid, troponin for MI, digoxin levels if it's appropriate. And then chest X-ray, again, you're pretty much looking for heart failure. There's not much of a role for uh, an acute echo or a, you know, an urgent echo, except if you're you know, thinking about tamponade and that's less likely unless there's certain scenarios where they've had chest trauma or they've had an MI, um, but chronically, mainly looking for signs of heart failure, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, valvular abnormalities and structural abnormalities that might lead to scar tissue formation. And then you probably want to get a tape and if it's appropriate, look for, um, you know, focal neurology and examination. If there is some, then it might be appropriate to get a CT head.
So briefly talk about reflex bradycardia causing syncope. So there are certain situations that can cause patients to um, have unopposed parasympathetic inhibition of the heart rate. They normally recover very uh, promptly. I think I spoke about some of them in my um, previous presentation on falls because they can cause people to fall. Um, so some of them are, one of them's fear and pain, you know, good example as well as needles. Um, post uh syncope can occur in elderly men. Nausea and vomiting, and then you've got various surgeries, dilatation of the anal sphincter and cervix, but also extra ocular muscle um, pressure can, can also cause reflex bradycardia. And then you've got laparoscopic surgery, all straining on the toilet, so intra abdominal pressure and increase in that can cause reflex bradycardia too. So sinus bradycardia is uh, probably one of the more common causes of being bradycardic. Um, essentially, it's very much like sinus tachycardia. You want to identify the underlying cause. Make sure you look for MI. So you make sure you're asking patients the correct questions um, and examining them to make sure they've not had, you know, uh, an, an anterior MI really, um, and subsequently had bradycardia as a result. You've got third degree heart block, which essentially likely to need a pacemaker. And then you've got six sinus syndrome which is persistent sort of symptomatic bradycardia. So indications for um, a patient to have a temporary pacemaker put in. So on your shift, if a patient's got symptomatic, hemodynamically unstable bradycardia and you've tried atropine already, then that would be an indication. If they've had an anterior MI, so not inferior because that's quite common, but an anterior MI and second or third degree heart block, then they'll need, um, they may need temporary pacemaker too. And if they've got trifasicular block pre-surgery. And that's just um, some second degree block. So the management of bradycardia is pretty much the same across the board um, initially. So first step is uh, IV atropine. So they need about 500 micrograms. You can try um, up to six times, three milligrams. And then secondly, um, you want to consider, if this doesn't work, consider transvenous pacing. So if they've got risk factors for asystole, you know, complete heart block, broad QRS, if there's recent asystole, if they've got Mobitz type two, if there's ventricular pauses that last more than three seconds, like here, then these are risk factors for, a, for the patient developing asystole as a result of bradycardia. So you want to consider transvenous pacing even if atropine has worked. If it's secondary to a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, then you can consider glucagon. So that's the end of um, the presentation. If you're if you feel like you're a bit rusty and you don't quite remember how to manage or how to sort of um, categorize tachycardias or tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, and have a look on the Rhesus Council website. We've got some nice algorithms that kind of uh, kind of really help to jog your memory in an emergency. Um, there'll be a feedback questionnaire which I'll post on the chat now, um, and the next session will be next week, um, same time at three o'clock. Thank you very much. I'll just pop the link in the um, chat once I work out how to do it. Thank you. And if you could just take 30 seconds to fill that out and then you are free to leave. Thank you.